Welcome to topic nine, the final topic in coastal hydraulics, and we're going to deal with tides and um, storm surges in this topic. The first uh, video will talk about tides, the second one, storm surges. So, in relation to tides, we'll talk about the factors that influence tides, we'll talk about how um, tides might be modelled, and then tidal currents. And the, um, we'll begin by talking about astronomical tide, which is produced by the combined uh, gravitational fields of the Earth, and we're going to imagine the Earth is um, completely surrounded by, by water, there's no land masses, the Moon and the Sun. But let's firstly ignore the Sun, we'll turn that off, and just think about the Moon, because the Moon's gravitational field is stronger than the Sun's um, when you're on Earth. So the pull of the Moon um, distorts the shape of, um, of the Earth's oceans and produces this elliptical shape where the water closest to the moon is drawn towards the moon and we have a flattening on the boundaries and then um, a higher tide also around this side of the, the planet away from the moon. So high tides here and here, low tides here and here. Now the moon com completes a full um, lunar orbit um, in a little over a day, it's about 24.8 hours. Um, and so, um, as the um, as the moon moves around the Earth, and uh, the Earth rotates relative to the moon, um, the um, the location of the high tide shifts and move, moves around the around the face of the Earth. So, if you imagine standing on the on on the surface of the Earth, you would go through two high tides um, as the moon completes one full cycle. So, a lunar tide, a single lunar tide, is um, half a lunar cycle, which is around um, half the lunar cycle, is around twelve point four um, hours. Now, if we um, turn the sun on again, um, in this position, the sun effectively acts in the same way as the moon, and so the two um, amplify uh, these tides, and we get a much bigger um, tidal cycle. And this is called a spring tide. So when the moon's in this position. Or if it's over here, the two, um, the, both the moon and the sun, um, combine um, in a positive way to create a bigger, a bigger tide. So it's a spring tide. If the moon and the sun are oriented either like this or, or this, then the um, they, they they actually counteract each other. Um, and although because the moon's stronger, we still get a um, a tide, um, an elliptical shape in this water body. Um, uh, the, the tides are much weaker, and that's called a neap tide. So that's the astronic, astronomical tide cycle. So the, um, the sun's orbit around the Earth, or at least the full rotation of the Earth, the diurnal cycle, uh, takes 24 hours, whereas the Earth, the moon's orbit, takes slightly longer than that. Um, it's about 24.8 hours. And so the, the, the Earth, uh, the Sun and the Moon gradually moving out of phase, which is why we get you know, full moons, um, new moons, half moons, the lunar cycles. And they signify the relative alignments of the, um, they, they will identify the relative alignments of the Sun and the Moon. And when the, the Sun and the Moon are 90 degrees out of phase, you get the half moons. And so that's when you get the, uh, the neap tides, the smaller tides. And when you have the full moon or the new moon, you get the spring spring tide. That's when their gravitational fields are in phase and combine to produce the bigger tides. But this um, has assumed that the, um, the the sun and the moon are directly over the equator. Sometimes the moon actually um, sits uh, either in the northern or, or over the southern hemisphere, and, and that's referred to as um, a declination. Uh, and so the ellipse um, is distorted, as shown in, in this figure here, not around the equator, the axis of the equator, but at some um, um, angle to the equator. And so we can get higher tides in one one um, hemisphere than, than than the other sphere, or at least higher tides um, in one um, in a full diurnal cycle, a full um, diurnal cycle, we can get um, one big tide and one smaller tide, and you can see that, that effect here, and that's called a daily inequality, where you get a big, a, a bigger tide, one bigger tide and one 
smaller tide um, after it. So that's the um, what's called the, the astronomical tide, the combined effect of the Earth's, the Moon and the, the Sun's gravitational fields. But in order to produce tides, you actually need a current because we're shifting water around the oceans between the high and, and low tide regions. And as that water moves, of course, there's land masses that get in the way. Um, and so um, those currents interact with the land masses and we get very quite complex um, tidal patterns produced as a result. And those effects, those interactions with, with land, are called, are called secondary effects. And here we can see um, an image showing um, the, uh, the, the you know, simulation of the Earth's tides, um, red being high, low being, blue being low tide, um, uh, as it's affected by um, the various land masses. So in practice, we can really consider the tides to be the sum, or astronomical tides to be the sum of three effects. Um, the effects of the moon, which has a semi diurnal cycle, um, the spring neap cycle, which is associated with the relative phase of the sun and the moon, and the daily inequalities that vary both on a 29 day and an annual cycle. And each of those constituents can be represented by a, uh, a um, sinusoidal function, this cosine function we can see here, and summed to provide the net um, uh, tide tidal level with this of the mean sea level represented here as a naught. So this is of course the angular um, frequency which is 2 pi divided by the period which, which we know for each of those three terms. So if we knew what um, the amplitude was um, then we can work out what the, the, uh, the water level is for any point in time. So associated with these changes in water level with tide are, are, are currents. If the water level goes up in one place and goes down in another place, there must be a current um, of water between those two places to produce that change. And so that's referred to as a tidal current. Now that current is effectively um, a, a, a wave. And because the wavelength of these waves are very large relative to the depth of water, we can use the, um, the shallow water um, equation for the wave velocity, which is the square root of gravity times depth, which we've encountered before. So in an ocean with a depth of around 4 kilometers, the velocity of that wave is around 200 meters per second. So if we consider a bay, then the water flows in another bay, that's called the, the flood tide as the water moves into the bay, and the ebb tide as the water moves back out of the bay. And we have high tide slack water at the change between the, the flood and the ebb, and we have low tide slack water between the ebb and the flood. Now in the situation where the opening to the bay um, is large relative to the volume of bay, then the water level in the sea and the bay can be completely in phase. However, if the opening is small um, relative to the size of the bay, um, the maximum water level in the bay will occur later than in the sea, which means that the flow will continue to enter the bay for some time after high water in the sea. Um, similarly, in an estuary we have um, the flood and the ebb as sea level rises and falls and water moves in and out of the estuary. Um, and there's some point up the estuary where the tidal inf influence um, can't penetrate any further. At this point, the water level remains stationary through the tidal cycle. As we move downstream, we get a rise and fall um, with, with the tidal range. And this area in here, the dashed area, is referred to as the tidal prism. So AA denotes the entrance to the estuary and B is the upstream extent of the tidal effect. So this tidal prism, and this is looking in side view and this is plan view, it's possible to work out uh, the total volume of that tidal prism and that's how much water moves in and out of the, um, of the entrance uh, with uh, the rise and fall in the tide. So if we know the volume of water that moves in and out of the entrance with, the, uh, with a tidal cycle, uh, 
we can work out the average current through um, that estuary entrance. That's not necessarily the maximum current, but it's the average current. That's the, the volume of water divided by the time, uh, which um, over the um, a, a flood, a single flood period, uh, which is when the water is moving into the tide, it's half a full period, so it's around six hours. If we assume a side new soil tidal cycle, we can actually work out the maximum discharge through the entrance if we know what the average discharge. Now remember the average discharge is the tidal prison volume divided by half the period of the, um, the tidal cycle. So here we have the tidal cycle shown as a sinusoid. Um, this, this might be the volume of water held within that tidal prism. And this um, falling tide here, the, the ebb tide, um, shows, uh, is shown here. Now the line um, drawn, drawn from this high tide straight down to the low tide, the gradient of that line is the mean discharge uh, through, through the entrance of the estuary. Um, the peak discharge actually occurs halfway through that tidal period uh, and um, uh, is somewhat larger than the average. Now we can use mathematics to show that the, the maximum um, discharge, uh, uh, Qmax, is pi on 2 times the average discharge that we calculated previously. So using this equation, we can, we can translate the average to the maximum.